All right. Just got the word. We're live. What's up, everybody? Thank y'all for tuning in. This is Tyler Burns, host of the Antidote Television Show. The price is the cure for culture. The conversations create further ground for change. Thank you guys so much for joining this live hangout. Um, this is in promotion of the Beast Mode Tour, which is coming to Pensacola, Florida on November the 14th. 7 o'clock p.m. at New Dimensions Christian Center. It's going to be featuring beautiful eulogy, uh, Shyland, Theory Has It, and our special guest tonight from Lampmo Recordings, Mr. Stephen the Levite, formerly one half of Redeemed Thought, now a member of the eloquently put Lamp Mode 7. Um, so thank you so much, Steve, for joining us, man. This is exciting. Welcome. Mm -hmm. My pleasure, man. Happy to be here. This is my first uh, Google Hangout interview, and I'm a big Google fan, so this is dope for me, too. Cool, so, cool, cool. yeah. So, let's basically get it sparked right now um, in terms of what you guys uh, what you guys do at Lamp Mode, man. Before we get into that, let's get into a 30-second brief introduction of who you are. Who is Stephen the Levite? What's the essential that we need to know? <clears throat> well, I'm a believer, um, believer in Jesus Christ. Um, I'm a member at my church, Epiphany Fellowship. I'm married to my wife, uh, Trisha Bell, um, who is also, uh, you know, kind of the um, her and her partner are, are art so. Um, so they're kind of putting on the tour. So she's been. She's also my manager. Um, I got two kids, Stephen Levi and Brooklyn okay. JL. Uh, I see what you, you know. did there. I see what you did there. Nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's three, or he's going to be three in February. Um, daughter just turned one. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I love Jesus. I love hip-hop. Um, I love hip-hop culture. And, uh, you know, i um, been doing this for about a little over ten years. So um, just happy to be here. <laughs> awesome, man. Great. Now, uh, can, you remember, can you remember the first time that you – heard hip hop, um, and it, it entered into your ears. What was that experience like for you, if you can remember? Um, I think, and I could be wrong, um, the first the first time I remember listening to hip hop is um, my dad had some heavy D tapes um, back in the day. And um, I remember being in the car with him and just listening to it a lot, and that kind of being my first, like, intimate uh, you know, um, you know, experience with hip hop, you know, like there's been a lot of stuff on the radio and stuff like that and music videos, but, um, you know, MC Hammer and stuff like that. But, um, and I might've, I might've heard some of that stuff, but like the first time I remember my dad actually playing some at home was heavy D. So, okay, yeah, cool. man. So, yeah. so who were your favorite artists growing up? Is it something that heavily influenced you? Were you influenced by a whole bunch of different forms and genres of music? Yeah, man, I've been influenced by a lot. Being raised in the West Coast, um, you know, but also just being around before the West Coast got big. Um, so I heard a lot. You know, I heard MC Hammer. I heard Heavy D. I heard a lot of the uh, more positive stuff. Then I started hearing, um, you know, my uncle started talking about NWA and, uh, Ice Cube and Ice T and uh, you know stuff like that and Public Enemy and uh, Naughty by Nature, Queen Latifah, uh, you know. So I, I've been you know so it's it's been a while, but I think I think some of my biggest influences would be like Wu Tang Clan, um, you know, uh, definitely a little bit of Eminem, um, uh, a lot of the West Coast stuff from back in my day, like uh, like. Uh, Ra uh, Rascast and hieroglyphics and stuff like that. Um, you know, Tim, Timothy Brindles, Shylin, Fanatic, The Truth, like all of them uh, were huge influences once I got to Philadelphia. Um, I didn't do a lot of concerts, a lot of hip hop concerts until I got to Philly. So actually seeing them perform live uh, influenced the way that I saw things because I was actually seeing people respond to lyricism so it changed the way that I thought about how I wrote um, because up until then I hadn't really seen people do it live you know what I mean so um, so I've had a lot of influences Ooh. well is it proper to say that you found hip-hop before you met Jesus 
And yes. What happened that really led you to conversion and faith in Christ? Um, I had a dope youth pastor, man. I had a youth pastor who plugged away at me for like at least a good four to five years, um, just preaching the gospel to us like every every week, you know what I mean, weekly at our youth group. And um, he was he was interested in me and as a person and in my my you know my fatu infatuation with hip hop culture and was. You know, he was intrigued. He was asking me the difference. What's the difference between hip hop and rap? And what's all that about? And uh, you know, so he just, you know, he just cared. And um, you know, hearing the gospel for so long eventually clicked. One day, I ended up throwing away all my secular hip hop, and uh, you know, just realized I was a sinner in need of His grace, and and repented and and turned to the Lord, and it's been on since then. So, yeah. Now, I guess you kind of uh kind of spoke to what my next question is going to be. What is your definition of hip-hop? Uh, a lot of people have different definitions of it, and then they mm -hmm. create different uh, segments of rap versus hip-hop. Mm -hmm. you've, been, you've been one of the promoters of not calling stuff mixtapes. It's not <laughs> literal mixtapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the, master, the master definer. Uh, what's your <laughs> um, that's a that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that, but um, I would say that hip hop is a culture of people who are defined or not defined by, but identify with uh, a music genre that we call rap or hip hop, and have you know similar values, similar uh, cultural um, you know styles of dress. Um, you know, influences, um, you know, all the things that, that we all kind of collectively identify with that make us us. Um, you know, you can see somebody on the street dressed a certain way and say, yo, that dude's hip hop. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I think it's just all of us having the, a similar value system. We, we like, you know, loud drums and, and samples and record scratching and stuff like that. And that sets us apart from other cultures. So, um, yeah, so I think that's I think that's the definition. If you want to get into rap music, I, a lot of the old heads in the in the culture would say like rap music is the music, but hip hop is the culture. So, yeah. So is hip hop something that to you is is organic? Like you even said that you hadn't necessarily heard someone ask you that particular question. What is hip hop as a definition? Is mm -hmm. it something that you kind of you kind of see it? You kind of know it when you see it type deal? Um, like I've been like I've been around the culture like for you know for a while and um I've I kind of consider myself a student of hip hop culture, um and by that I mean that I grew up in an era where um where I would when I was at an intellectual um, maturity enough to inquire about things, um hip hop was being taught you know what I mean so I was listening to the Wake Up Show. And KRS-One like had just started this whole movement of the Temple of Hip Hop, and um, you know this idea of the four elements of hip hop and all that. So I was a student because I was listening to the music, but I was also getting indoctrinated by um, what hip hop was and who started it and when it started it, and, and you know who was around and who the old heads are and who the who the, who the, um, the OGs are and who started it, um, you know all that type of stuff. So. Um, so it was something that I was, you know, that it wasn't just an organic, like, oh, I was just around hip hop, but it was also, because, you know, I wasn't, I was in Temecula, California, where um, I could count my, you know, African American classmates on two hands, and wow. a lot of them weren't even hip hoppers, I would say. A lot of them were into booty bass and, and Tupac and stuff like that, um, and it was my Asian Filipino uh, Latino friends who were the hip hoppers. They were the ones who were the DJs. They were the graph writers. They were the B boys. And so I ended up leaving the black people to kick it with the hip hoppers because I identified with them more culturally. Um, so, um, so yeah. So it wasn't a lot of hip hop in Temecula, and I wasn't necessarily around it. But I would definitely say that the music brought it to me. The radio brought it to me. The little bit of radio I did listen to, um, and and that's kind of how I learned the culture and learned the music and the value systems of of what I would call hip hop. So, now you kind of touched on something culturally that's 
like the transcendence of hip hop. And a lot of mm-hmm. people we know this because, you know, even on the on the Beast Mode store billing, I mean there's beautiful eulogy. Mm-hmm. Are not not African American brothers, but are still killing it from a hip hop perspective. From mm-hmm. people who are kind of just tuning in and they're like, Well, I thought hip hop was just an exclusively black thing. Um, yeah. there's still like people who think that um, African Americans have kind of this imprint on what hip hop really is that that it's not you know transcendent. Can you speak mm-hmm. kind of to the transcendence that you've seen, even working with somebody like Timothy Brendel, um, mm-hmm. on the, the transcendence of hip hop? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the question part of that again? Uh, just to talk, you want me to talk about the transcendence yeah, of hip hop? Yeah, just the transcendence of hip hop, even, you know, from dealing with, in your case, a, a good friend of yours is Timothy Brindle, you know, someone who, who isn't culturally the same as you are. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk about, like, like just the power of hip hop to be transcendent across gotcha, okay. racial and economic and social lines? Yeah, I think, I think hip hop is. I think that's one thing that Christianity and hip hop have in common is that um, hip hop is one of those things that is unique in culture because it's one of those things that has crossed a lot of racial, national, geographical barriers. Um, you know, I remember watching, um, I think it was a Wake Up Show video um, tape where they had a Wu Tang Clan performing in China or Japan. And just how many fans there was, and it was just like, yo, this is crazy. Like, this is worldwide. And even even when we first started putting out records, um, and we weren't really that popular, we were getting a lot of sales in the UK, and we were like, what's going on? Like, I don't understand. But um, so yeah, so there's like hip hop is just one of those things that, um, for whatever reason, and Matt Chandler was kind of talking about this too uh, with his interview with Rapzilla, just how. Um, you know, you can go to the sticks of, of Hillbilly, Suburbia, or, or wherever, and you're going to hear somebody drive by banging Biggie or Tupac or something, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, you don't really see that with other other cultures or other forms of music. Um, hip-hop is just this really widespread phenomenon that, you know, I'm still trying to figure out. So... Um, so I think it's just dope. I just think I don't understand it completely, but I know that there's uh, there's definitely um, the opportunity to take advantage of that for the sake of the gospel and and spread it to as many cultures as possible. Um, you know that are willing to listen to it. So, yeah. well, we're uh, we're we're here. Uh, if you just tuned in. We're here to talk with Stephen the Levite, a limo recording artist, also part of the Beast Mode Tour. Once again, Beast Mode Tour is coming to Pensacola, Florida. New Dimensions Christian Center on Wednesday, November 14th. We got a fan question, Steve, um, mm-hmm. from a guy named Eddie. He wants to know why you chose Stephen the Levite. Like, how does that name reflect your personality, identity, and your pursuit of Christ? Got you. Um, well, I, I picked my name at a time where rappers had, like, they would have two-part names, but they might not necessarily be related. <laughs> so... Um, so first to clarify, Stephen from Acts chapter 7 was not a Levite. Um, I've definitely seen that a couple times. Uh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I picked I pick Stephen for, for, you know, reasons I'll kind of get into later. But the Levite part, um, I picked that just because at that moment in time when my studies, I was kind of studying music in the Bible, and I noticed that in the temple... Uh, the Levites were the only ones doing any singing, um, you know, because it was a priestly duty. And so, uh, you know, I felt like I was called to music. And in my at my my understanding of New Testament, Old Testament relationship at the time, calling myself a Levite was kind of my way of saying, like, I'm called to do music. So, um, so yeah, so that's the only reason I picked it. There's been a lot of other things since then that have kind of made it made more sense. But um, that was really just the, the authentic uh, re- reason for picking that name. Okay, cool, cool. Makes sense now, now that you put it together. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the first time I heard it, heard of you on a track, you were doing the, um, what was it, the Higher Definition Cypher. Ah, uh, 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 got you. Mm-hmm. Way, way back in the day. That's when yeah. you were part of a demon. Um, so now you're a solo artist, you're part of the Lamp Mode 7, as they say. Um, how is being a part of Lamp Mode and being around those brothers, which you guys are kind of pigeonholed as lyrical theologians, mm-hmm. um, but even within even within Lamp Mode, there's a, a whole bunch of diversity. 
um, yeah. in terms of styles and even beliefs that we've seen from the, the chopping blocks that you guys have done. What's it mm -hmm. been like being a part of Lamp Mode and being able to build with um, different brothers? I think it's been good, man. I think um, being connected to such a wide range of styles and genres and um, you know, influences has helped me to kind of grow as an artist to see um, hip hop through different eyes. I definitely started off as like a staunch uh, pharisaical purist <laughs> for for hip hop, and um, you know, like when you when you get on a label and you're working with somebody like Jason, um, like you can't have that kind of perspective all the time because you're gonna clash heads and. Um, you know, I think the gospel kind of overrides those kind of values and causes you to look at music through um, a more accepting, um, you know, a more accepting view viewpoint. So, um, and that is not to say that I've dumbed things down either. Um, I think I've learned to see what I value and things that I probably would have been blind to before. Because Jason is a dope lyricist. Right. If Absolutely. Anybody who heard his verse on Timothy Brindle's uh, project, um, both yeah. tracks, both the um, the joint about the tax collector and the the cipher joint, like cipher joint was crazy. Yeah, nobody oh. can front on the fact that Jason can hold it down on an East Coast track or whatever as a lyricist, um, and and weigh in just as heavily as the rest of us East Coast style rappers. So. Um, so I don't think I've I don't think I have to dumb down my my senses necessarily, um, but I have learned to you know like grow to kind of um, respect even if it doesn't fit my taste um, what Jay Sun does and what my brothers at Reach Records do and um, you know cat you know Flame Flame was kind of the beginning of it for me like learning because you know being around cross movement at the time and and learning to appreciate. Uh, you know, other styles of hip hop. Um, Flame was kind of the first person I looked at and said, "Okay, well, he's not East Coast, but he's actually pretty dope, and I can I can get with it." You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah. So I, I definitely think it, it helps me to grow as an artist, and and even just getting feedback from cats who think differently. Like if it wasn't for Jay Sun, um, SOS probably wouldn't have had West singing on it. It was his idea. Like, yo, I think you should have a singer on it. And I was just like, at first I was like, a singer. Man, this is supposed to be a hip hop, you know what I'm saying? Type, like I, I was trying to do like Tribe Called Quest, like not have any singing on the girl track, you know what I'm saying? I was trying to keep it, and but I thought about it, and I was just like, you know, I think he's right. I think there's a way to bring in the harmony and stuff without compromising the the old school hip hopness of it. So, um, so having cats like that around kind of make me better as an artist. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So. What makes you rap? I mean, you're obviously gifted and talented in it, but I mean, everything that we're gifted and talented in doesn't mean mm -hmm. that, doesn't mean that we actually, you know, pursue it. Um, it mm -hmm. can be a hobby or something off to the side. But um, I kind of want to get your perspective on what motivates you to do rap albums versus full time vocational ministry or something mm -hmm. related to that. Because most guys they think, um, well, I, I can rap, so I should, you know, put out albums. I should be signed. I should get mm -hmm. a deal. I should do whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So what motivates you to say, this is what I'm called to do, and this is what I should be doing, and, and spending a whole bunch of my time promoting it? Um, my first thought is, there's not too many other things that I do that well. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, you know, some people are gifted with mad stuff, like my wife. Uh, my wife was a dancer. She can act. Um, ah. she's, she's running a business now. She's, you know, she's got a whole bunch of talents that she can pull from, um, that she can make an occupation out of. Um, and you know, when I compare myself to her, which isn't totally biblical, but nevertheless, we do it anyway. Um, but you know, when I compare myself to her, I'll say like, yeah, I got about like maybe two things <laughs> that I could do. Um, and hip hop is one of them. So, um, you know, but I mean, I'm sure that's probably not true, but um, I think I think hip hop is one of the good the things that I am good at, and I don't say that arrogantly. I say that um, based on just people giving me feedback and God blessing it, and um, you know me able me being able to make not necessarily a living from it, but you know a little bit of extra money to take care of stuff around the house and whatnot. So, um, um, so I think the Lord's with it, and I think that's kind of what motivates me. I think when I first started as a believer doing it. 
Um, I definitely put it down for a season and was trying to figure out whether it was something the Lord even wanted me to do. Um, and kind of being motivated by um, just the fact that I have the gift and it's not mine and I should be giving it back to the Lord kind of put me back um, into doing it. So um, so I've been just trying to do it just for the sake of doing it, and the Lord's been just kind of blessing it. Up until, you know, this tour, really, I haven't, I've never asked somebody to, to book me for a tour, for a show or for anything. It's just been people requesting um, ever since I started. So um, I've never I've never done anything, um, you know, just trying to make it or make my name big or anything like that. It's always been just the Lord, like, pushing things forward and booking requests coming in and, um, you know, the Lord putting stuff on my heart to say so I play, you know, so an album comes out. Um, and whatnot. So I think at this point, um, it's just become a career as well. So, um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the gist of it. Well, I mean, we can definitely affirm that you are skilled at, <laughs> at hip hop, man. It's, uh, it's crazy, crazy dizzying lyrical uh, um, skill, talent, man, and the metaphors, and everything that just flows out of you. We can tell it's not only something that the Lord is with, but it's also something that you're naturally gifted at and mm. kind of to piggyback off of that point the intricacy of your rhymes is mm. crazy um, and I kind of want to get into that a little bit later when we talk about a few specific songs on The Last Missionary mm. but man like is that is that what you wake up with in the morning and then that's just flowing out of you um, is that something that happens all the time is this something that you kind of uh, pull away for a season and write and then it flows or you put it together like puzzle pieces or how does that 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 writing talent work? Um, it's weird. Like, uh, like, I didn't start off writing like that. Um, especially coming from the West Coast, where things are a little bit more abstract. Like, you know, you kind of see the more abstract style coming out of like, you know, the Humble Bees camp. Like, it's not necessarily a whole lot of structure, and you know, what I mean, the same like structured rhyme scheme for a whole song. You don't really see that. It's still dope, it's still dope but it's just but not it's that just style. Um, and like, that's what my stuff used to be like. Um, but after getting to Philadelphia and seeing specifically Shy and Sim, I remember seeing them do, uh, Saved by Grace live and, and watching people respond to the rhyme schemes live. Like, I think that's kind of what motivated me to step up my rhyme scheme game. And then being partially OCD <laughs> attached <laughs> I like I, my, mentally I attached myself to that kind of structure and order, okay. and and it just became second nature for me. And the next thing I knew, like I couldn't stop doing rhyme schemes like that. So you get an album like uh, The Last Missionary, where almost every joint it feels like the rhyme scheme is maintained throughout the whole song or at least the whole verse. And Ooh. and it's not like I did it on purpose. It's just that I was. I couldn't avoid it. It just it just came to me. So um, so does it come to me like that in the morning? I don't know if I would say that. It definitely takes effort, and it takes me hours to write because I'm so – like I said, it's like OCD. Like you, you, you walk into a room, and you can't help but see, like, things out of place. <laughs> and, like, so when I'm writing, I can't help but write stuff that fits into this structure, this organization that I've kind of set up in my mind. So – um, so yeah, so that's kind of how it works. So what you're telling us is all these intricate rhyme schemes and internal rhymes and literary devices that you use, it's not that you necessarily choose it, it's that it couldn't be done any other way for you. Yeah, kind of to an extent, yeah, like it's, it's, it's a habit that I'm trying to break out of to an extent. <laughs> um, like, yeah, because, yeah, it's just, I just can't help it. Like, if I start going that way, I, I kind of keep going that way. And um, I can't help but see all the other, um, like, all the other words that rhyme with it kind of just come to me that way. Or, you know, I'm like, I got like a, you know, I got a bunch of other words in my head that rhyme with that. And so it's hard for me to leave that scheme alone and try to move on to something else. So, um, yeah, it just kind of happens that way. I think if we were to pause right now and just listen closely, we'd hear writers and rappers throwing their, their pens and notebooks, man, because it's crazy that you can just see that and put that together. That's definitely a gift. And, uh, 
man, that's crazy to think about that you can't really see it any other way. And it's almost something you have to turn off at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a blessing and a curse, I guess. So <laughs> once again, if you're just tuning in, we're chatting here at the antidote. Um, Stephen the Levite was going to be featured at the physical stop of the Beast Mode Tour on Wednesday, November 14th. New Dimensions Christian Center. You can get your tickets today, by the way. You can get your mm -hmm. tickets um, right here on antidotetelevision.com for $10. YouTube, eight or more, it's $8. And, uh, so keep it locked here. All right, Last Missionary mm -hmm. is your most recent project. Mm -hmm. And from the Dias game to the Forerunner EP to the Last Missionary, there was a little bit of a gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions that we got from fans is, um, you know, what did you do in, in that gap? And did you change or grow or alter your style? Mm -hmm. um, well, the biggest thing was um, around that time, Redeem Thought was still trying to figure out what we were doing. We ended up kind of breaking up for a season. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, our lives were kind of taking, like, taking different directions. He was getting married. Um, you know, I started going to Epiphany. I met my wife there. We got married. Um, and I started realizing how um, my philosophy of what um, being a part of the church looked like needed to change. And so I spent a lot of time focused on um, being a part of the mission that Epiphany was doing in North Philadelphia. And hip hop kind of took a back seat for a season. And, um, you know, and during that time, like I said, I got married. Um, and life just got really busy. <laughs> um, I was busy at Epiphany Fellowship. I was busy trying to take care of my household. Um, we had a couple kids in the process. And, um, you know, and so I was just like, wow, all right, I need to get back to hip hop. Um, but I need to make sure that I don't do what I did before and squeeze out the local church in the process. And so I was very kind of slow getting back into doing hip hop. Um, so there was a lot of growth um, for me just as a man. Um, Today's game came out from a single dude, kind of fresh out of a breakup, um, not really, um, you know, plugged into a local church, not really a member necessarily, um, you know, and, you know, just that, you know what I mean? But I think when you get to the forerunner and the last missionary, um, I'm married, I'm a part of my church. Um, I got a couple kids now. I feel the responsibility of providing for a household. Um, I, I'm taking response. I take ownership to my church. And so um, I feel like I'm a part of the mission there. And, um, you know, so there's a huge gap that you get between that. And I think you see that even with the content. With today's game, you hear a lot of me kind of coming after the church. Um, and then with the last missionary, what you have is a contrast of me saying, hold up, what are you saying about the church? Like, Jesus doesn't play that, you know what I mean? So, um, uh, so yeah, so there's, a, there's definitely a huge growth that takes place there. Um, it, it, it's kind of weird to hear you say, um, after today's, or during the today's game process, you were completely against, um, or not necessarily completely against, but not necessarily plugged into a local church, mm -hmm. then to listen to a song like Membership from mm -hmm. the church album, where yeah. it's like, man, if you're not a part of a church, how do you know if you're saved? And uh -huh. it's like, whoa. So what? how did that, like, was it teaching? Was it people challenging yeah. you? Like, what swung that pendulum? Because one of the things I'm running into, um, and I think a lot of uh, churches are running into, is the gap of young adults who don't mm -hmm. feel church is even necessary. Like, why yeah. should I go to church? What's the point? So yeah. what changed your mind from not being necessarily committed to taking ownership? Uh, definitely being a part of Epiphany Fellowship, um, being discipled by my pastor, uh, Eric Mason, and, you know, just being around that and in the early stages of it, because I was part of it when it first planted. So um, part, being part of a church plant, um, like, there's definitely more of a sense of ownership because there's not a lot of you. Um, you contrast that with coming from a church where there's thousands of members, um, it's easy to kind of hide in the midst of, of what's going on and and not feel responsibility. Um, but then you contrast that to being a part of, like, the first 30 members of the church. Um, and, you know, if you don't do it, it doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So 
Um, and then, you know, just feeling that weight of responsibility and seeing the way people uh, respond to that responsibility um, definitely kind of lit, lit a fire in me to talk about those issues and, um, and you know, and even looking back and seeing what I was and, um, you know, the way that hip-hop culture in general at that time was kind of responding to that, to that kind of responsibility. Um, you know, like, kind of helped me to, to, you know, like, I felt responsible enough to go back and say something. Um, so, so yeah, so it was just, you know, it was just, it just seemed natural to me that, you know, I talk about what I'm going through, what I'm living, what I see, and, you know, the things that, you know, make me angry or make me excited. Um, and so it was just natural for me to turn around and say, yeah, I'm talking about me too, but this needs to happen. You know, I need to say this, so. Excellent. Excellent. Um, now, it may be weird to ask you this, but um, what's your favorite song on The Last Missionary? Um, is that um, is it, is is it a, weird listening to your music? Is it weird listening to yourself rap? Yeah, it, well, kind of. I think I've grown more comfortable with it over the years, um, and I've seen more of the need for it in light of, you know, just needing to know my own music and memorize it and whatnot. Um, so... So yeah, so it's 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 still kind of weird, but um, the weirder part is trying to pick a favorite. Um, <laughs> um, it's it's hard for me, depending on the week or the day of the week. I could have a different answer for you. Um, right now, it's probably the last missionary. Um, I'm I'm kind of just pulling that out randomly, but uh, I, I I definitely I definitely think it's one of the better tracks on the album. Uh, you know, lyrically speaking, uh, content-wise, I think it drives home the point. It's relatively short. It's one of the few songs that I play in the car, and I actually run it back and play it again. Um, so, so I think I think it gets the thumbs up for right now for that reason. <laughs> now, in your tone, especially on uh, like the single "Give It Up" and on a couple mm -hmm. other places, you referenced it earlier. You're kind of confrontational, mm -hmm. pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, what what prompted the the more aggressive tone? Because I can even see from from Tadai's game that mm -hmm. just your whole vocal tone has changed and shifted a little bit from being mm -hmm. uh, kind of a little bit laid back, more in the pocket, and you're still that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. Then also like a, a, a higher pitch and aggressive uh, tone in your raps. So yeah. why is is it with the content of the last missionary being about the church mm -hmm. that which you were kind of trying to drive home? I think. Um... I think I've always had uh, a confrontational bent to my music, but I think that um, I think over the years I've grown in my ability to use my voice. Um, if you listen to um, like early Redeem Thought stuff and you hear my voice on those tracks, I sound like a little boy, and um, and I've always been a chill person. I've always been a very chill, relaxed not loud person and so um, like my voice was something I had to develop over the years I couldn't just get in the booth and, and scream at the mic and get a verse done and it sound good um, back in you know 03, 04, 05 so um, and I think just growing up too like as I'm growing up like you know I, I can hear more bass in my voice <laughs> you know what I'm saying because I'm just getting older um, so all of that stuff has kind of helped me to better use my voice the way that I wanted to use it back in 05, but couldn't, you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, so I think, so I think it's, it's that, that aggressive confrontational, uh, uh, character to my lyrics has always been there, but, um, the, the ability to actually perform it that way hasn't. So, um, this, yeah. this as a side note, man, like it's really dope to hear you talk about just your growth as a person, as an MC, mm -hmm. as an artist. A lot of people aren't willing to say, hey, back then I didn't know what I was talking about. And I was still <laughs> making art to the best of my ability, uh -huh. but I was, I was kind of off. I needed to be chiseled. I needed to be worked on. Mm -hmm. Now like, I feel like I have a better grasp. I'm still not there yet. Mm -hmm. So just to see that growth, that's yeah. really dope. Yeah. And it's kind of it's typical of your music. Like You're very honest. Yeah. And even to the point of being like, whoa, like most rappers are not willing to be that <laughs> honest. Like yeah, they kind of create this uh, this character, or I, I think they're creating caricature of themselves. 
mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? I'm super um, hyper spiritual, and you know, back in the '90s, it was I'm killing demons and all this mm-hmm. other stuff. Yeah. And then from there to now, with your music, it's like, hey, especially on a track like Temptation, I don't have it all together. I struggle. Um, I kind of go through fluctuations. Why is there no difference between your rap life and your real life? Why is it important to kind of make those one? <clears throat> well, I think I think it's just important to be as honest as possible. I think I think I think with hip hop specifically, um, there's more of a um, you know I think there's more of an outlet for being honest. You can t- kind of talk about anything really. Um, I will say this though. I will say that. Um, you know, having experienced it as an artist, I will say that as honest as you are on record, there's still a whole lot that people don't know about you. Right. Um, and you know, I can be as honest as as I want to be, but still, like you're only getting like a snapshot of a person's life when you listen to an album. And um, <clears throat> you know, you don't know whether right after they wrote that really honest track, they you know a week later they were back in the bedroom in the dark, you know doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing or, you know, whatever. So, and you don't get the little, the little slips and falls in between. What you get is kind of a broad picture of, I've struggled with this. God gave me victory at this moment. You know what I mean? And then I wrote the track and then you don't get what happens after that unless you get the next album. So, um, so there is a, there's still a, there is still a gap between the rap life and the real life. But, um, <clears throat> I do think that I've 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 done a decent job anyway of trying to uh you know make that gap as small as possible. Um and I think and I think that's what connects people cuz I think especially with um with lyrical theology specifically there's um there's more of a tendency for people to feel like they're not emotionally connected to the artist. <clears throat> and I think that music is so emotional that it is necessary to have some of that involved. And I think it's good to um, teach people how to think through what happens in their life uh, with a biblical perspective. And I don't think you can have that without um, bringing your own personal life to the table. Um, and also, I think I'm just not one of those. I, I know I know there's some rappers who can kind of read a book and then just turn it into a song. Um, and I'm not one of those people, like, I, I have to process it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't just read the book, I have to read the book, think about the book, meditate on the book, experience something in my life that reminds me of the book, um, draw comparisons, and then, you know what I'm saying, then be able to turn it into my own thing. Like, I'm not going to take the title of the book and then turn it into a song and name it the same thing. I'm going to experience the book. I'm gonna process it. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna. I'm gonna label it something that that's more familiar to me, and then I'm gonna write a song about it based on that experience. Like, um, so that's just kind of the way I write, the way I process, the way I put stuff out. I have to. I have to own it. You know what I'm saying? It has to be mine before I can write it. Yeah, you kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, I'm thinking of a way back interview that you did with DJ Wado, and, uh, and mm. you kind of talked about the organic style that you came to Christ. And it was a mm-hmm. reference in particular, I believe, to um, just how you were raising your kids and catechesis and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so it makes sense now that you kind of ex- have experienced something. Like some mm-hmm. of us, we just, we've grown up in church, so we just grab it and we hear a scriptural mm-hmm. principle and we just, we just assume it's true. But mm-hmm. for you, there, there's got to be that life. And I think that's yeah. a good reminder as well. Um, yeah. uh, one, of, one of our favorite songs that, that you have is obviously the SOS joint. Mm-hmm. Um, and can you talk about your your even in even in the the album as a whole? You're very specific in your your courtship process. Your mm-hmm. happen. You're like, hey, I even just slipped up a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. talk about basically give some advice to courting couples, and also mm-hmm. what if what has marriage taught you about the gospel? All right, for a uh, I think well, I think the biggest thing for for courting couples is to um just to just to I think one of the things that's helped me out is to look at courtship as mission. <laughs> um I think that um you know since the relationship between Christ and the church is kind of the template for marriage um I think uh I think it also is a good template for courtship as well in the sense that um 
Christ's uh, incarnation is a good picture of what courtship looks like. Um, and uh, so I think there's much to draw from the gospel. I don't think you should throw the gospel out of the door and just run to the next, um, you know, courtship book or, you know, dating book that you find in the Christian bookstore. Um, I think there's much to be pulled from the gospel itself. Um, so I guess that's the biggest the biggest help right there. Because I think, um, you know, I think with courtship, there's a lot of kind of, uh, good practical tips that people can give and it can be seen as legalism because people don't see how the gospel is applied to that or how they came up with that um, but I think once you grasp the gospel and people start telling you stuff like you can kind of pull the wisdom from the gospel and kind of draw the lines between the two and say okay I see why they say that let me go ahead and walk in that wisdom and not just reject it because you didn't find it in the scriptures um, so I think that's, I think that's kind of my biggest tip for them. I think, and I think marriage has just taught me, um, like I learned in part of the reasons for the last missionary, like it being the way it was formatted was because I learned marriage and church at the same time. Um, and so it was easier for me to see the correlation between, um, love Christ like you love the church and just the church, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like seeing Christ's relationship with the church and seeing my relationship with my wife, like at the same time. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I've, so I've learned a lot about just how the two relate, what, how the mission of God relates to both of those. And, um, and it's, you know, the, having that experience has changed the way I looked at the Bible as a whole. Um, it's hard for me to see God's expressions of love outside of what mission looks like. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's kind of the biggest thing I've pulled from it. And with that comes just a whole new way of looking at the whole Bible. Oh, that's really dope advice. Um, let me talk about one of my favorite songs on the album. Probably my favorite one. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of up there, like Voltron and Beauty mm -hmm. and the Beast are kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> Got you. and and for me, I love Beauty and the Beast, man. Like the the mm -hmm. flip of the metaphor, um, relating beauty. Uh, well, I won't give it away, man. Talk about Beauty and the Beast. Just tell them, tell them what the thrust of that was. Um. Well, I, I, it was one of the few concepts that I had before I had like a beat or any lyrics written down for it. Um. um I think even before I started officially working on the album, I was just like, yo, I got to do this song where I talk about, um, you know, basically just the idea of Christ being the lamb at first and the church being seen as kind of like this dirty prostitute before. And then the two meeting and then, in, you know, seeing the revelation perspective of the church being beautiful and Christ being a beast. And, um, you know, it was just something that I wanted to say. I feel, I feel like it was... It's a storyline, so I'm not really as, um, you know, aggressive or confrontational about it, but it was my way of kind of saying, like, like one, don't sleep on the church, and two, don't sleep on Jesus. Like, they may look one way right now in their earthly form or, you know, in the pre, you know, pre-revelation, pre-redemption, um, but, you know, come, come, you know, when the day Christ comes back, it's going to look completely different, and you're going to regret all those crazy things you were saying about both of them. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, so it was just it was just my way of trying to communicate that. Okay, so my man Eric, he he mm -hmm. uh, he sent in a question about Voltron. He said there's a lot of '90s and '80s hip hop feel to some of your songs, particularly Voltron. How do you mm -hmm. feel that impacts that impacts uh, Christian hip hop today, especially with other labels pushing music in a different sound? I think I think it's good for the diversity of it. I think um, you know I get a lot of responses that sound like, "Yo, I haven't heard anything like this in a minute. I've been waiting for an album like this." And um, you know, I think I have a kind of a niche audience, so to speak. That you know, and I think I think a lot of my audience um, they can get with you know the reach stuff, or they can get with um, some of the other stuff that's more popular. Um, but like deep down inside, they wish that Boom Bap would come back, and I think um, I think I kind of fulfill that need for that audience, um, you know. And, I, and you know, I'm one of the few 
I think that there's a lot who are either really underground or don't get as much um, attention as I do, um, and not for any reason in particular, but, you know, it's just how it is. Um, and so, I, I'm, you know, I've, I've always had a philosophy where I've tried to make music that's, um, I've always kind of modeled Wu-Tang to an extent, because they always had an underground appeal, but they were, but they were mad commercial in the sense that people knew who they were, and like, um, so I always wanted to make music that was underground enough that the underground cats can identify with it and say it's underground, but, you know, commercial enough that people are going to make noise about it and you're going to hear about it and, you know, it's going to be seen. So, and obviously the market is different now, so it's not totally like that, but, um, but that's kind of always been my desire. So, um, so I just, I just make music that I like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, by God's grace, other people like it too, so. So there's no, there's no philosophical or uh, sonic dichotomy or duel between you guys and Reach or you guys and some of the different other labels. I think a lot of people don't really assume unity nowadays. Um, yeah. So they assume this sort of um, antagonistic view between labels and especially what you got, what you guys are doing mm. with Humble Beast um, in terms of the Beast mm. Tour, in terms of uh, promotion, in terms of relationship. There doesn't seem to be that duel between the labels. Um, can you talk about your relationship um, mm -hmm. musically, even though you may not necessarily appear on tracks together? Is there still that amicable relationship between mm -hmm. Reach and the labels like that? Yeah, I mean, I've done, I've worked with almost all of the artists on Reach Records um, in one way, shape, or form. Um, I've been on, I was on After the Music Stops with the Cray. The World. I was yeah. on. Um, I was on Identity Crisis with Tadashi. Um, I I was on um, uh, I was on one of the remixes for one of the special edition versions of Trip Lee's project. What? Um, you know. Oh yeah, that's yeah, right. The invasion, on, the invasion joint. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was about um, to get mad, you know, man. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done anything with with Shy on one of his projects, but Show was on the project with uh, with for the Craig. So. Um, so I've been able to work with a lot of them, a lot of the older artists anyway, a lot of cats with a lot of the newer car artists I haven't been able to work with yet. But um but yeah, so I've always been like, you know, those are, those have always been my peoples to an extent. You know what I'm saying? When I see them at a show, I'm like, Oh, it's good, man, it's good to see you, you know what I mean? I had a long talk with K B after um after a legacy conference or whatever and, you know, got to, you know, kinda of chop it up with him for the first time. Dope brothers, so I'm excited about that. Um and then even with uh, with Humble Beast, it's funny. Like uh, I met Braille a while back because he got me and uh, me and Use One tickets to see him open up for James Brown at the House of Blues uh, back in the day. Mm. Yeah, so because they had the same management back then, and um, you know, so uh, so we hooked this up and we got to eat afterwards, and so we started building with him then, and that's kind of the beginning of my relationship with him. Um, Odd Thomas, I actually saw him perform live in California before he was Odd Thomas. Um, so when I met him at a legacy conference like a few years back, um, it was kind of like dope seeing how he'd grown as a person and as an artist um, and kind of just kind of started a relationship for us as well. Um, theory has it, I rapped over one of his beats back in the day, the Ezekiel 16 joint. Um, but I'm looking forward to kind of meeting him personally. For real, for real, during the tour. So I, you know, I've been kind of looking forward to him, and I love his three albums. So I'm a fan of his music and his beats. Um, and um, you know, so it's it's kind of been like, you know, what I mean, like not necessarily like a full front, like you know, full on, on, like like you know, we're around them all the time or anything like that. But there's been little like beginning steps to us kind of starting a, a kind of more in depth relationship. Um, you know, just even back as far as 10, 11, 12 years ago. So um, so it's been a long time coming, but it's been part of God's sovereignty and bringing the two camps together. So, Oh, yeah, what he's talking about is bringing them together for the Beast Mode Tour, y'all. Pensacola, Florida, it will be here November 14th at New Dimensions Christian Center. Tickets to $10. You can get them right on the website. Groups of eight or more is $8. Okay, now let's get into Beast Mode Tour, how that, how mm -hmm. that basically came about. Um, what do you think about the lineup? What do you think about the mix of the artists? And um, we'll get into what what we can expect in a little bit. But but the mix of the artists, um, yeah. sonically, stylistically, you guys are are all really really um, intricate lyricists mostly, and, um, mm -hmm. and all solid solid artists. 
Um, mm-hmm. So what do you think about the lineup? Are you, are you excited about it? Yeah, I'm excited, man. I mean, the last time I haven't seen – the last time I saw Braille and Art Thomas perform, they were both performing as individual artists. Um, so I'm looking forward to just seeing what they look like on stage together as a group. Um, Theory has I've only seen him live um, once, but it was on a television show, so I'm looking forward to seeing him live. Um, you know, Jay Sunshine, I perform, I've performed with them a few times, so I'm, I'm big fans of them, obviously. Um, and, you know, I think I think um, putting all of this together is going to come out to a good show, I think, you know, by God's grace. So, um, so I'm, I'm anxious to see what it's going to look like. We're going to, I got to hit, you know, we got to see what that's going to look like as far as presentation and stuff and, um, you know, working out <clears throat> how it's going to look for the day of. But, um, but yeah, I'm excited, man. I think it's a dope lineup. Um, and, you know, God's graced all of us with, with, you know, with some dope talent, I believe, and I think it's going to be dope. So. so so can we expect some creative displays? Um, I just want to know, is it going to be any freestyling, acapellas, man? Because, I mean, you guys are all incredible lyricists. Mm-hmm. I just want to see y'all just, is there going to be like a beast mode cypher or, you know, somebody doing backspins or, you know, <laughs> I'm just, I'm um, just curious, man. Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't had enough time to really kind of like write a song together or anything like that, and um, there's not a lot of overlapping songs for us. Unfortunately, hopefully next year, next year we'll, we'll if if God grants us another year of doing the Beast Boy tour, it'd be dope to kind of have some stuff like that. Um, so you probably won't see too much of that, but you know we, we're still uh, we still have yet to kind of talk about like other things that we can do to kind of make it more. Um, to present the unity um, in a more um, like visual way, so um, so yeah. But you're gonna, you're definitely still gonna get you know a dope show with you know a lot of a lot of dopeness. So <laughs> oh, cool. dope show with a lot of dopeness. That's what we like to hear. Okay, now as we're as we're winding down here, we're gonna get into some fan questions if that's cool. Uh, yeah, that's these dope. are kind of like some some rapid fire questions uh, that the fans have put forward. Um, Kelsey asks uh, you, what mentorship and discipleship uh, relationship has made the biggest impact on your life and your career? Um, I have to say two. Um, I've already kind of mentioned them. My youth pastor from back in California, um, Pastor Kenny Cahey, and we called him Bro K. He, you know, like I said, just poured into me, like, you know, discipled me into the kingdom. Um, and then also, you know, my, my pastor now, um, Eric Mason from Epiphany Fellowship, um, you know, he's just been a father figure to me, um, you know, and just poured into me and taught me a lot of what I know and what I dish out. A lot of the doctrine you're hearing on today's game, or not today's game, but The Last Missionary, um, is just me processing what I've learned from him and spewing it out in my own words. Uh, so, um, so those two people, I would say, are the biggest influences for me. Uh, yeah, I actually podcast uh, Dr. Mason, so mm-hmm. I'm kind of I'm kind of tracking with y'all, and I always get my head just rocked with, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with just what the Lord has given him, and just the way he puts it. Um, mm-hmm. It seems really tailored for people who are kind of hip hop um, mm-hmm. affiliated. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, Casey asks, if you weren't pursuing hip hop, what would feel that? What would you fill that gap with? If, if hip hop wasn't even a part of the equation in terms of you doing it, what would you be doing with your time? that you normally devote to? Um, I'd probably just be doing more of the other things that I don't do as much. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a facilities manager for Epiphany Fellowship. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I wish I could do that I don't do because it's time. Um, you know, I'm also kind of pursuing a job as an electrician right now. So, um, you know, hopefully I'll, you know, if the Lord wills, I might start doing that after the tour. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd probably just be doing a regular 9 to 5 like I'm trying to do anyway. Um, um, but I don't know if I'd, I'd find any, I don't think I'd, like a lot of people probably have like a movie director or a beat maker type of answer, but, um, but I, don't think, I don't think I'm, yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'd be doing that. Maybe writing books or something like that, if God will, but um, I don't know. But I think, I think hip hop is just the, the thing that's filling that gap now, so. Have you thought about writing books or pamphlets or, or, or things related to that that can be passed out to people and kind of concentrated more on, on not necessarily theology but also like your life mixed in with it? Um, 
I've thought about writing books. I've never had anything jump out at me like, yo, you need to write about this. You know what I mean? And um, I'm motivated by content. So, um, so I've never had content that motivated me to want to write a book. Um, you know, a blog or album, yes, but just not a book yet. So um, I don't know. By the Lord's grace, maybe something will pop off in the future. Um, it's definitely something I'd like to do. But like I said, I just haven't had anything jump out and say, yo, I need to write a book about X, Y, and Z. So I don't know. Pray for me. Maybe it'll happen, but we'll see. <laughs> That'll be cool, man. That'll be cool. Okay, this is my question. Top five artists that are alive. Top five. <sighs> I don't know, man. That's hard, yo. That's one of those questions we get all the time as rappers, and we never have the same answer for it. Cause and, it and it doesn't have to just be hip hop. It doesn't have to just be. It can be anything, all right, man. All right. So if we're gonna go just like in general, like all kinds of artists. All right, Michael Jackson. Okay. Um. Stevie Wonder. Uh. Quincy Jones. Okay. Um. Um. Who else? Um, cool G Rap. <laughs> uh, Big Daddy K. I'm probably going to go over on the five. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of I, I, I like a lot of artists. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like I left out genres even with that five. I'm like, Dad, like I left out like August Burns Red. I really like their music. Um, yeah, like what's 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 the uh, attraction to the metal, man? What's what's the attraction yo, to the metal yo. form? <clears throat> so I don't know. I, don't I just, know. I, just I, I I remember in Bible, remember college, in Bible I college, college, I thought it was demonic. It was demonic. So, so um, <laughs> and but by the time I moved in, um, in the song came out, talk about the spot where Josh and Brendan live. Um, Josh and uh, Brendan were Brendan part, of, uh, part of uh, a hardcore uh, punk band at one point, and, and so they kind of so introduced me to metal. Me to metal. And, and hearing the um, the more rhythmic style that Living Sacrifice brought to the table um, really just got me into it because they didn't just have a drummer; they had a percussionist also. And so it had more of this percussion type thing going on, and I started getting into it. Um, and from then on, I've just been in love with it. I listen to it more than I listen to hip hop, probably. Um, so I don't know. That's crazy to think about. That's that's crazy. I don't know how it happened. Um, but I think I think just the musical part of me likes it. I compare it to jazz, um, because of just the the way the music switches up and the the crazy time signatures like I compare a lot of the metal I listen to to like Dave Brubeck um I don't know if cats know who Dave Brubeck is but he's got the five the take five joint the dinner like take five is the five count it's not your typical four four B where it's just you know you know kick there kick there you know what I mean it's it's weird. It's like how does this work? It feels good, but I don't know how to bob my head to it. So, um, a lot of metal is. Like, I, think, I, think I think I just I just I just, I just like it. You know what I'm saying? I, there's something about it that makes me say, "How the heck did they come up with that? What made them say I'm gonna make it? I'm gonna make five instead of four in the, in the rhythm, like or like Living Sacrifice they had this one joint where it was like I don't even understand, like. It was like a, was like, a, like, a like a nine or something. Nine or something. It, was, it was it was something weird. So weird. I was just like, I like it. I, like I don't it. even know how to how to track that out. It was just weird. So I just like the complexity of it. You know, I think it's once again it's just my OCD clinging to it and saying, how does this work? Um, but I I don't know. I just it just happened and I love it. So. Oh, that's that's dope. That's dope. I, I heard somebody say uh, recently in a poem, they were talking to somebody and they said you are. Um, I think they were talking to a relative or a nephew, and they said the most hip hop thing you can do is to not be afraid to not be hip hop. Like, yeah. So, yep. so that's yeah. that's really yeah. cool to see that perspective there from you. Um, mm -hmm. How long have you been growing out your beard, man? Um, got to know, got to know. Inquiring uh, mind, I want to know, man. I think it I think probably, probably started, started probably, probably after today's game, a little bit after today's game. Um, 
But I've had to I've had to trim it in between. Like I had to trim it when I was looking for a job a couple years ago. So, you know, I brought it a little lower, but it grew back pretty fast. So um but after it gets too strong, it just kinda of stops growing. So <laughs> I can I get split ends and stuff and so I gotta trim it and then you know, but uh, but it's been growing for a few years now. Okay, cool, cool. All right, uh, just a couple of more. What's your favorite game to play with your kids? Actually, I actually, like I, like, I just like I just tickling like my son. My <laughs> he actually he requests, requests that I tickle him sometimes. So, so it's just our favorite thing to do, or whatever. So because you know he laughs, he smiles. You know what I'm saying? It's, um, you know, it's like it's it's just the best time to see that much of a smile on his face and him laughing and enjoying himself. So I enjoy him having that much joy. So precious moment. Yeah. Precious. Uh, it, has there ever been a prank that you guys have, uh, that the guys from Let Mode have pulled on you, or you pulled on them? Because because in the in the chopping blocks, I think there's this perception. First of all, there was a perception that you guys all agreed theologically, and uh, were amen in each other completely in every aspect. And then there was this mm -hmm. other perception that maybe even I had that you guys are really serious cats. Mm -hmm. um, but being around you guys, I mean, you chill. You'll laugh and you'll joke. You'll mess with each other. You'll take a little poke yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even Jason has added so much like life and stuff to it. I uh, yeah, come from like yeah. a different place, a different style. So has there mm -hmm. been a prank that you guys have played on each other? Uh, unfortunately, I can't say we've pulled any pranks on each other, but um, um, but you know we like definitely you know, prank each other with pillow fights and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, apparently Jason is like a lethal pillow fighter. Like, there's a there's a rumor that he took out like a bunch of 19 year olds because they tried to jump on, him, and it was it was it was a bad idea for, on their part. So think about that life. Yeah. So um, I think yeah, there's not too there's not too much like practical jokes. Like you know what I mean. Uh, crazy stuff that you might hear from other cats, but there's definitely a, a playfulness about us and um, jokes that happen off screen. And uh, Jason is probably the biggest joke in our moment. So him and Tony. <laughs> now this uh, our fan, uh, I think his name is Rajan from Sydney. Um, mm -hmm. What's up, man? Hope you're hope you're watching. Uh, he asked, "What advice do you have for an aspiring MC who quit rap because my culture didn't feel it?" Um, he's from Sydney, so he says it's not like an appreciation um, for it. What do you? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to him? Um, I think that uh, this is a tough question. question. Um, only because, only because I think I think, think to an extent, extent I feel the same way in the way sense way that, that um, what I bring to the table isn't always appreciated. Um, I think um, it's I definitely think easier to see that, that um, um, masses. masses prefer just to make kids to, and they don't really pay a lot of attention to the lyrics. So, um, so I guess the, I guess my biggest advice would be to check his motivation. I guess, um, because I think for me, if I was in this boat, I'd still be rapping because I'd just find the artist. I'd find I would find the market that enjoys what I do. Um, if it became uh, overwhelmingly apparent that. You know, my gift isn't really a gift, and there isn't a market for what I do, then I'd quit. You know what I'm saying? But um, I think for me specifically, if I really think that, if I really believe that I'm bringing a lot of dope artists to the table, and that somebody's going to appreciate it, or, you know, there's 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 got to be somebody out there who does, I'm not going to quit. Um, so I think, I think, so I guess, I guess my advice would be to check his motivation. Um, because uh, I, I, you know the world isn't just you know Australia and Sydney. You know what I'm saying? I think, um, especially in light of the internet, you know what I'm saying. He might have people who really appreciate his music in the U.S. or Europe. Like I really want to go to Europe because I always hear that they're like really appreciative of soul music and lyricism and stuff like that. Um, even more so than they are in the U.S. So, um, so that's even me personally. I'm just like, yo, let me check out Europe. You know what I mean? So, um. I don't know. I think I think back other countries to see if there's still you know if there's a if there's a a market for what he does. Ooh, nice. Uh, one more question. I was watching um the art of rap something from nothing a documentary mm -hmm. and it was really um 
it's it's an okay documentary for me. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if I don't know if you had a chance to view it, but what was most interesting was the overt defiance of hip hop. Because um, mm-hmm. hip hop by nature is very defiant. Uh, basically, how it originated was a response to oppression, a response to injustice in an artistic way. And so mm-hmm. there was just this overwhelming defiance. And I mean, you know, I see is is asking them questions. So he's one mm-hmm. of their own. But even towards like when he's asking the questions, they're they're looking at the camera, they're throwing the middle fingers and they're cursing out out people and saying, you know, throwing the F bombs and this, that and the other. And I'm like, man, why is hip hop so defiant? And then for mm-hmm. your case, you even talked a little bit about it on Temptation. You're a mm-hmm. Christian, you're not necessarily making music for the radio. Um, mm-hmm. and you're and you're hip hop. Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you like just basically balance your uh, your nature to just be rebellious and defiant. Um, I think that ultimately, um, I think just I think an appreciation for biblical, for biblical values, values um, um, and I don't know, just don't know, a, an the, adherence the, to, to um, um, you know, a good you know, ecclesi- ecclesiology, ecclesiology um, um, understanding, understanding my my role. Um, um, in the church and in the body of Christ as a whole, um, I think it's just I think it's just natural for for you to you know to to allow biblical standards to kind of override the the cultural um, norms for hip hop. Um, I think there's some redeemable elements to it um, in the sense that. You know, like, you know, like you know, hip hop is a way to talk about stuff that you don't hear, hear about in, you know, gospel you know, music or, you know, rock music rock. sometimes or whatever. Um, and, you know, like, I think there's, you know, a lot of times in, in biblical history, you see cats like um, the prophets who were, you know, willing to go against the grain and say what God was saying, even though the people didn't want to hear it. Um, so I think there's well, I think elements there's of that that, were, that, that are redeemable, that are redeemable. Um, um, but also but at the also same time, the there's a lot of um, rebellion that you have to overcome that comes from the culture, um, and uh, you know, and it makes its way into the church sometimes, into hip hop culture, and and you know, like you kind of said earlier, that's that's what I was trying to address on the album, but uh, but yeah, it's it's just something you have to you have to love Jesus more than you love hip hop, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. One more. I was gonna ask this earlier. Actually, uh, we didn't talk about Fight Club or Muse One. Any mm-hmm. chances for a reunion? Redeemed Thought mm-hmm. reunion. Mm-hmm. Fight Club was crazy. Um, was and I, I wasn't even necessarily like, I was, a, I was a kind of peeped you guys when y'all Redeemed Thought, but I wasn't like a mm-hmm. huge, huge mm-hmm. fan. Yeah. Um, but I yeah. loved Fight Club and to see gotcha. the growth gotcha. from you know true beauty goodness to now. Yeah. Any chances for that? Any chances for a reunion? It's possible. It's possible. We're, um, We're, um, you know, we both kind of have a lot of, you know, since we were individual artists and kind of made a lot of plans, um, you know what I'm saying, it's it's something we kind of have to work into our schedule, you know what I mean, Muse One, he has like maybe three projects on his mind that he wants to accomplish in the near future, um, and I personally, I got like two projects I'm trying to accomplish soon. Um, so it, you know, you know, by God's grace, it'll happen, happen, but it will take, uh, take, you know, it'll take some effort on both of our parts just to find the time to actually do it. So, um, two projects coming out soon, or we're working on them right now. Yeah, um, yeah. One of them is kind of a surprise secret situation, so you won't be hearing anything about that one yet. Um, but I am trying to, you know, pick out beats and um, think through a theme and a content, um, concept and content um, for, for my own personal uh, solo project probably next. So, um, yeah, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to top of it and not let another six year gap happen. So, um, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're wrapping it up. Is there any chance we can get a, we can get, you know, a, a little, uh, a little eight or or sixteen or you know. Uh, uh, I'm just asking, uh, man. I mean, <laughs> come to the tour. Come to the tour. <laughs> okay, good. Buy good. Buy come come out. out. You know come what I'm out. saying? That's even no. better. That's no. even better. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so guys, this so. has been an incredible hangout with Stephen the Levite, part of the Lamp Mode Seven. If you guys don't have the last missionary, 
if you don't have the last missionary, what is wrong with you? Um, you need to go pick it up right now. Right now, it's on iTunes. Tell them where they can get the last missionary, Steve. Um, your best bet is to go to landmode.com and order the hard copy, get the poster, get the T-shirt, the artwork. Like, people sleep on the artwork, you know what I'm saying? They buy the CD or they get it on, um, you know, they get it on Amazon or iTunes and they miss out on having the, like, I know for me personally, and I'm kind of on a tangent now, but when I felt the texture of the CD case for the first time with the artwork. That's so true. Yeah, I was like, I was blown away by the product, not because it was my idea, but because I just thought it was really dope. So, um, so indulge yourself in the experience of buying the album and get yourself a physical copy. Um, but if you just, you know, you just new school and you don't want to do that, you can get it on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, um, wherever you buy music, it's available. So. Um, yeah, I can personally attest. I got the deluxe, man, and uh, got pretty much everything except the instrumentals. Um, and man, it was, it was crazy just looking at it for the first time. Like I was just staring at it for a while because it was so well put together mm -hmm. and uh, so well done. Where can people keep up with you at? What's your Twitter handle, your Facebook? Um, the Whistleblower um, uh, is, the, is the Twitter handle. Um, Facebook, if you just, you know, actually, if you want to just Google Stephen the Levite, you should find me on all of those. So Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus, um, wherever you do social media stuff at, I should be there. So... Um, and if I'm not, let me know, and I'll try to make it happen. <laughs> cool, cool. So if you guys listen, here's what we're going to do, because we're feeling super generous. Um, if you guys are watching this Google chat and uh, you put hashtag STL, hashtag STL, and you uh, tweet the antidote, at antidote TV, hashtag STL, and you tell us what is currently, if you've been watching, you tell us what currently it's Stephen the Levite's favorite song. What he said earlier. What's his favorite song? Where are you listening? If you do that, we'll hook you up with the last missionary shirt from Lampmode.com. But you have to uh, tag us, put the hashtag STL and, and uh, at Antidote TV with Stephen the Levite's favorite song from the last missionary album, and uh, we'll hook you up with that. That sound good, Steve? Yep, that sounds dope. Good, good. Well, once again, this is for the Beast Mode Tour. Um, which is coming to Pensacola, Florida, and it's also coming to a city near you as well. Beastmotor.com. Check out all the dates and buy tickets, support. Um, you got beautiful eulogy. You got Shy Lynn. You got Jason. Theory has it. And the main man, Stephen the Levite, as well. If you want to come to the Pensacola stop, that's Wednesday, November 14th at 7 p.m. at New Dimensions Christian Center. Tickets are $10 can be bought right here at AntidoteTelevision.com. Steve, is there anything else you want to say to the people? I uh, lo love y'all, man. Looking forward to seeing y'all at the tour. Um, keep your eyes open for new stuff. You know what I'm saying? There's always new stuff going down. So, um, yeah, keep your eyes open. Dope. Well, this has been The Antidote. Um, I'm Tyler Burns, and we thank Stephen the Levite and Lamp Mo for allowing us to have some of And as we always say on The Antidote, you've just been handed The Antidote. It's up to you what you do with it. Peace.